Hi everybody, this is Sandra Angelo broadcasting to you live from Sandyland. Super excited to be with you again tonight. And I'm losing track of what day it is. I think it's day 12 uh, out of 14 days that we're doing live broadcast here in Sandyland. And um, I have been loving uh, watching you guys comment and uh, I've been getting tons of email from you and I've been getting phone calls and I've been giving getting messages on Facebook about how excited you are about finding and fulfilling your dreams. Hi Debbie, hi Lori, so happy that you're here. It's blistering cold, it's, it's below 70 in San Diego tonight. It's been raining pretty much all day yesterday and today so we actually have weather. So normally we have nothing to talk about on an elevator because we don't have weather in California. But we have weather today and I've been by the fireplace a lot of the night tonight and um, I've been uh, working on videos for Pencil Drawing College. So I am super excited. We're about I think two or three days away from opening that college and I am super excited. But tonight's topic is something that some people are sensitive about and that's how old are you? <laughs> you know, um, age is a state of mind. I mean, my friend Nita, who's 91, can literally walk faster than me. I can't keep up with her. And she has the mindset of a teenager. And she has chosen not to have let age have anything to do with anything that she does. And so, um, so I'm going to be talking tonight about age and passing your sell-by date. Now, I don't know how many of you will admit to being over 40. I am. <laughs> and that's as much as I will admit. I mean, I'm in my third chapter. And so, you know, when you get into your third chapter, what matters to you and the way you act and the things that you decide to do are different than they are in your first two chapters. And so I'm going to talk tonight about the third chapter and how you can be super successful. Okay, Debbie's joining me in admitting that she's over 40. <laughs> and I don't know why our culture is so kind of prejudiced against age. I mean, they, they have an ageism in this culture that if you're not young, um, then you don't matter. And young and beautiful <laughs> and rich. <laughs> then you don't matter, but it's just not uh, the fact. Uh, so many people have made such a difference after age 40, and Boyd's admitting he's joining our Over 40 Club. So, um, and so is Lori. So anyway, I'm going to talk today about passing your sell-by date. You know, when you go to the grocery store, I always look at the tag on my eggs and my bread and milk and stuff like that to see when this is going to expire, like what is the sell-by date on the bread and on the milk? I want to get the freshest one, so I look at the sell-by date. And, you know, when I hit 40, I kind of felt like I was going to pass my sell-by date, you know, because we live in a culture where youth is everything and um, where you're supposed to be beautiful and you're supposed to be young and you're supposed to be you know, full of energy and athletic and all that kind of stuff. And um, it, it doesn't value age. I grew up in, a, in Africa where they do value age and they think of age as having wisdom like I believe the Asian culture thinks that way too. And they really value the people who are older because they know how wise they are and uh, they've already made all the mistakes so they know what not to do. And they can warn you about what you shouldn't be doing. So I really, I mean, I really thought about this for quite a while. I thought about it for probably a year or two years, thinking about, you know, had I passed myself by date? I mean, was it even possible for my dreams to come true? I mean, I sort of felt like, you know, maybe it was too late, you know, so... I, here comes peanut butter, a little bit late today, but we're glad you're here. Say hi to everybody, peanut butter. Yeah, it's peanut butter and Sandy in Sandyland. Okay, sit down, let's have a nap. <laughs> okay, 
So, um, Peanut Butter has not passed his sell-by date. He's only a year and a half. That's why he's so feisty. <laughs> um, but anyway, I wanted to talk about uh, achieving your dreams at whatever age. You know, I mean, I've coached some people who started uh, being an artist at age 17. And one of the guys that I coached, that's his work on the wall. And he is now traveling the world full-time painting, and er he's earned over a million dollars following his dream. And I started with him at age 17, teaching him how to draw, and then I taught him how to make money. And um, he's doing great. But some of the people that I work with have been over 40, and they started over 40. And, um, I'll, I'll, and a lot of my people have been over 50 and 60 and 70. So we're going to talk about Nita Drought tonight because she was 70 when she started. And so in case any of you out there think that you've missed the boat and it's too late to become famous or too late to become successful in art, I'm here to tell you that it's not even close to being too late. Um, there is so much hope for you. Now, um, I'm going to go over a little bit later and talk about her work on the computer, but right now I just want to give you an overview uh, and the inspirational message that I always give you um, during this beginning part of our talk. And then I'm going to go over to the computer and talk about her progress and how she went from sick figures um, to amazing and then um, hopefully inspire you to do that too. And if you haven't signed up for PencilDrawingCollege.com, if you just happen to be here in Sandy Land and you've never signed up at PencilDrawingCollege.com, you need to do that tonight because tomorrow we have a surprise. And you're going to get an email. Everybody who has signed up at PencilDrawingCollege.com, and don't forget to type in the www dot at, for, in front of it, um, PencilDrawingCollege.com, you're going to get an email tomorrow that only goes out to those people. I have a list with thousands of people on it, but only the people in that group are going to get this email tomorrow. And we're, we have an exciting announcement to make. So, um, I'm going to talk about inspiration. So, Nita Drought started when she was age 70. She came to my drawing class and... She was a little late in joining, so she came to me to see if I would give her permission. And she brought me these, a sketchbook full of pitiful drawings. And she'd been drawing for a long time. She'd tried every kind of craft, macrame and, you know, pottery and everything she could think of. But she just got bored. She'd spend like a few months on each one and, they, and then she'd get bored. So she decided she might take up drawing. And so she, she showed me this um, sketchbook full of really bad drawings. And she said, do you think I'm eligible to join this class? And I said yes, because I never turn anyone away. I can teach anybody how to draw. Anybody. If you follow what I say. Some people don't do what I say and they don't get better. It's just a fact. It's like if you don't follow the recipe, don't be surprised if it doesn't turn out. So um, I said, yes, by all means, join our class. And her, her sketches were very rudimentary. They were as bad as the sketches I had showed to my college professor. And I'm shocked. <laughs> of course, I mean, it was his job to accept me, but I was as bad as Nita. I mean, I was, I was pitiful. So I knew she could become good because I had and I knew I could show her the way, and I'd been doing it. I've been doing this for 28 years, taking people from stick figures to photographic renderings in a really short amount of time. And I've been, for a long time, I didn't let any gifted people into my courses because they don't follow directions, and so they don't improve. And, um, but lately, I've been, in the past few years, I've been letting gifted people come in. If they follow the directions, they get to stay. If they don't, they're gone. So um, we, so I've been working with the non-artists for 28 years and taking them from stick figures to photographic rendering. So I, when Nita asked me if these stick figures were good enough, I said yes. And she was age 70. I didn't know that at the time. And uh, so she came to my class and she was drawing and drawing and, and, you know, doing what I said, taking it home, working hard. And then one day, 
I noticed that her work was really improving. I had always been correcting her and telling her to make it darker because she was always going way too light. Like all beginners, they're afraid of the dark, so they don't use the dark pencils, so that's why they don't get the full range of values. But um, I had given her, for her birthday, I would given her a set of 9Bs, which is the darkest pencil. And um, she was finally going dark with her drawings, and so all of a sudden, she went from peanut butter stop. <laughs> she went from really wimpy looking drawings to drawings that were popping off the paper. And at the time I was writing for the artist magazine in American Artist, I had my own column in Art Materials Today and Michael's Arts and Crafts magazine. I was making a lot of television appearances, so I wanted work to show on those in the magazine columns and the TV and newspapers and things like that. So that day I asked Nita, I said, can you, peanut butter, <laughs> I, I asked Nita, would you mind if I take this home so I can scan it because I'd like to use it in a magazine column and on a TV show. Well, unbeknownst to me, she, um, she said, of, of course, and she was so excited, but unbeknownst to me, she just like drove like the little old lady from Pasadena, she used to live in Pasadena, as fast as she could to get home to her husband to tell him, Sandra asked to publish my work. And this was weeks after she started. Weeks. I mean, I'll show you when we go to the computer how ridiculously good she got really fast. And this happens. It happens consistently to the people who do what I say. There are some people who are defiant and they don't do what I say and they don't get better. But the people who do, the results are amazing and fast. And so she was just ridiculously excited. Well, fast forward a little bit, and she became famouser, not a word, but I made it up, famouser and famouser and famouser because she got invited to go on television shows, and she got invited to be interviewed in newspapers. She ended up in magazine columns. Her work ended up on the cover of the book. That first drawing that I asked to borrow ended up on the cover of a book. And um, she, as I told you before, when she was 91, uh, 90, she's 91 now, she was invited to show her work in a prestigious gallery, huge art center, that they only invite 12 prominent artists per year out of 3 point something million in San Diego, only 12 people are invited to show, and she was invited for a one-woman show for a whole month to show 90 of her drawings from her collection of 500 plus portraits that she's created, to show 90 of her amazing portraits for 30 days to celebrate her 90th birthday. This is just crazy. This is from a woman who started with stick figures at age 70, you know? And here she was with worldwide fame and just, and she loves the spotlight. She loves when people ask for autographs and she loves when people talk to her. She's not like a braggart kind of person. She just loves people. And so she likes talking about her art. But here's the thing that happened to Nita. Now, people started clamoring for her work and they wanted to hire her to draw portraits and she could have made thousands and thousands of dollars doing portraits. So we had a conversation, we became very close, and for about five or six months we had a conversation where she was saying, I don't know if I want to charge for my portraits, I don't know if I want to be a portrait artist who earns money, should I do that? And we had lots of conversations, and after about six months she decided she, she just didn't want to do that. She didn't want the pressure of having to draw something she didn't want to draw. She only wanted to draw what she wants to draw, and she didn't mind doing portraits for friends and the doctor who, you know, gave her 20-20 vision with a operation and all these people who had helped her, she, she gave back by doing portraits for them. And she felt that she has enough money to live on, she doesn't need the money, and she's content with her lifestyle, she loves the fame, but most of all, she loved being able to give back because she felt like she had been so fortunate in her life and this was her time in her third chapter to give back. 
So that was something she was really enjoying. She would go to restaurants and she would meet people. She'd walk up to friends. She 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 said at nine at uh, seventy you need to start making new friends because your friends start dying off. And so her art was she would carry a little portfolio with her and she would walk up to total strangers and say your daughter's adorable. Would you mind if I draw her? And she made tons of friends because of her art. And then when she gave this portrait to them, they would just be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. So her circle of friends was expanding. She was starting to have younger friends and, you know, a wide circle, wide network. So, you know, she was really expanding through that. But then a surprise happened, and this wasn't a good one. Um, her husband had lymphoma. And they had been married for 50 plus years and they were best friends. They never had children because she had endometriosis and so they couldn't. And um, everywhere they went, they went together. In fact, if I invited Nita over for a girl's day out, Bob would come. <laughs> I mean, they were just, they were a match set. And so when Bob got lymphoma, it was just devastating, devastating for Nita. It was so hard to think of losing him. And that can happen with that disease. And so for about, I think it maybe was three or four years, he fought it bravely. And while he was fighting it, she would disappear for four to six hours during the day while he was resting and she would draw. And drawing just took her away from the world. It was like when you go into that serenity zone, the world doesn't exist. You don't get hungry, you don't get tired, you don't get cranky, you don't get stressed, you forget. You forget about the stress and it just melts away. And when she was in that zone, she literally drew four to six hours a day because she needed to pump up her battery and recharge herself so that she could cope with what was going on and that way she could be strong for Bob. And so she used you know, first used art to um, win awards and build fame, and she loved that. Then she used art to meet new people and build friendships. And now she was using art to siphon off stress. And it was making a huge, huge difference. And then the worst possible thing happened. Bob died. We were all just crushed because he was, he was so unusual. He was just such a special guy. And of course, it was just this huge devastation. 61 years they had been married. And that had been her best friend her whole life. And it was just grueling, just grueling to lose someone that you love. Uh, some of you know how that feels. I lost my dad. I lost my mom. I know. It's, it's just, ugh, you lose your appetite. You kind of lose your will to live. It's just, it's, grief is very difficult. Well, Nita is so smart. I checked in with her often to make sure she'd be okay and to be there for her and support her. I would have um, Tuesdays with Nita every week and I'd go up there and spend time the whole day with her just to make sure she was going to be okay. And uh, one of the Tuesdays that I went up there, I saw this drawing and I said, Nita, why are you laughing? And she said, I decided I'm going to go back and draw all of our courtship photos. And so she had all these photos laid out on her, um, on this big cabinet, and she'd gone back and she'd gotten a picture of the love mobile. Um, when he, when Bob came home from the war, um, he bought this car so that he could court Nita because she lived a ways away and he needed a love mobile to go pick her up. And so this car had been up on bricks and and um, and I think it was his dad that sold it to him. And so that way. They called it the love mobile because it meant that he could get from his town to hers to court her. And he'd drop her off at 10 o'clock at night and go back to his town in the love mobile. And uh, so Nita was drawing the love mobile. And the thing that was so interesting is I didn't even know this at the time, and I should have known this, but the art was mingling giggles with the crushing blow of grief. And you know what? Those giggles were softening that that grief. So the giggles mi mingled with the tears. Drawing someone that you love and you've lost, it's incredibly therapeutic. I've done it. 
I've done it with animals and my father and my mother and you know it's just because what happens is the movies start playing in your mind and it just rewinds this loop of all these happy things you find yourself laughing and you know rewinding that happy happy stuff that happened to you um, when you were together and it's so it's like it brings them alive again and then you hang it on your wall and every time you pass that they're alive and they're there with you I don't feel like my parents are gone I miss them I'd love to hear them say something when I talk to them because I do talk to them um, but they're here they're on my wall you know and everything that they gave to me is still with me because I rewound it while I drew them and Nina stumbled onto that and that's when I started to realize that that's another reason to draw because you can use the art to get rid of that grief and it softens that blow. I was having a conversation with Robert today um, about he's a he's a veteran and um, I was talking to this veteran that coached me through PTSD after the fire I had been captured in the war and thrown into prison and I was separated from my parents and for seven months I didn't know that they were alive and there was a lot of trauma and then when the fire happened it just kind of brought all that forward so I needed PTSD counseling and um, a miracle happened to me because miracles happened to me because I believe in miracles and the phone rang and it was a PTSD counselor saying we're looking for the fire victims and want to know if you want free PTSD counseling and I was like, yeah, sign me up. I need something. I was just really traumatized because it was like the final trauma in this series of traumas. And um, during that time, I began to draw and I began to go through the PTSD. And I began to realize that this therapy that Art was bringing me was extremely cathartic and very healing. And it helps you process the grief and it helps you cope with something that is so incredibly difficult and so Nina went through five phases of using art for her um, for just wonderful therapeutic person first of all it got her fame and she could have become very wealthy from that fame because she's known on five continents now she's been on TV She's been in newspapers, she's been in magazines, she's been in books, she's been in webinars, she's, you know, we just, just this last year we went and, and she had an interview again on TV. And she's just famous. <laughs> I keep telling her she needs to charge a dime for her autograph instead of a nickel. And so that fame um, brought her a lot of fun and she loves art shows and attention and all the publicity, she loves that. Then it led her to using art for stress when she went through her husband's illness every day she would spend four to six hours drawing to siphon off that stress because you know eighty percent of all illness is stress related if you can get rid of that stress you'd be surprised what happens to your body when you get rid of stress and so um, so then the second thing she did was use it for stress relief and then the third thing she did when she lost the man, the love of her life, after 61 years of marriage, he died, and she began to use art as grief recovery program. And now Nita is using art again to meet people. She's 90, she's going to be 91, I think she's 91 already, let's see, 91 or 92, I keep losing track. But anyway, she's way up there, over 90. And she keeps telling me, you know, um, it's like someone asked George Burns, why don't you date someone your own age? And he said, if I could find any my, one my age, I would. He was like 100 years old. And Nita's kind of the same way. She said, I am 91 years old and I need friends and my friends keep dying. So I just keep making new ones through my art. She carries a little portfolio of her artwork and then she introduces herself to people, strangers, total strangers and then she'll draw them and then they build this relationship and she has a wide network of friends at 91 she walks three miles a day and she draws several hours every day and um, you know her body's working great 
And um, I can't prove, because I'm not a, a scientist in a little white coat, but I know that art has really, really helped her. And here's the thing that's interesting. I've seen people, in fact, one of her best friends, at the same time that they retired at 70, this guy began to watch TV. He sat in a chair all day. He watched all these episodes of, of the news and stressful news and, and television, and he'd read the newspaper with all the negative reports. And he just, that's what happened. And pretty soon he was sick. He wasn't feeding his body by getting up and moving, and he wasn't feeding his mind by exercising his brain. You know, every muscle in your body needs to be exercised every single day. That's why I, when, and when anyone calls me on the phone, I walk. I can sometimes put in four miles during a phone conversation. I will walk. Every time the phone rings, I get up and walk. And I draw every day because it exercises the muscles in my brain. Art is like a, um, it's like aerobics for the brain. And art is like a spa for the brain. On my days off, when I'm allowed to, you know, Sundays, uh, and I can do anything I want, I draw. Because it's like cathartic cleansing of all the stress that's been accumulating in that week. And it, I don't care who you are, you've got stress. I don't care who you are, you've got stress. And so you need to siphon that off on a daily basis or if you don't, it's going to show up in illnesses. And um, I know that after the fire, I couldn't draw for nine months because I had damaged my right arm. And the stress built up like crazy. And it made my illness worse. I had a problem with my shoulder. And um, I ended up with this, uh, I forget what they call it. It was a frozen shoulder. I don't remember the medical term. I, I got to be in science. So, but I, I, the stress started to build up and I started realizing, oh my goodness, this is how other people live. They don't siphon off their stress until vacation or until the weekend. They wait and let it accumulate. Whereas before the fire, I'd been drawing every day, so I, my stress never built up. People always wonder why I'm always so energetic and happy and, you know, full of bubbly joy and stuff like that. It's because I get rid of my stress every day with my drawing. And so you can come up if you want. Come on. <laughs> and so, and this little guy helps me get rid of my stress too, <laughs> most of the time. Um, so art is a tremendous stress reliever and it has kept Nita active and walking and talking and making friends and and it's it's helped her survive after a brutal blow of losing her husband who was her best friend and you know she just bounces back because she understands the importance of taking care of your body mind and spirit and so I tried to get a hold of her today because I wanted to interview her here on in Sandyland but um, I couldn't reach her I don't know she's probably out taking her walk <laughs> Even if it's rainy, she'll go out with an umbrella. And uh, I called her about the time of day that she takes her walk. So she's probably out walking. But anyway, I wanted to give her as an inspiration to you. To let you know, number one, you have never passed your sell-by date. I don't care who you are. Um, I have a really good friend who was a very successful businesswoman. When women weren't successful businesswomen, they were just doing other things that were traditional for women, like being a secretary or being a nurse or being a teacher. Those were things women were allowed to do, or being a mom. And those are all great things, don't get me wrong. But women weren't allowed in business in those days. She, she, she was a groundbreaker. And she is retired now, but you know what? She's making a huge difference in my life because she consults with me whenever I have trouble in my business. And she's so wise. She's just full of ideas and... I, I love talking to her because we have so much in common and some women my own age don't even have that in common with me. And it's just fascinating to have a best friend who's a successful executive. And um, she's retired now, like I said, but she's still serving an amazing purpose in the world. 
It's, you're never past your sell by date. Never. And so, like I said, it took me a couple years to get over that I had, I, I was kind of thinking that when I hit 40, and especially when I hit 50, oh, I just admitted I'm over 50, um, that I, that life had passed me by and all the things that I wanted to do, I wasn't going to be able to do anymore. But here's the thing that's mind boggling. Not only did Nita succeed beyond her wildest dreams oh, after 70 by taking up art, but I, everything, every penny of the millionaire status that I have become has been earned after 50. Is that crazy? Everything that I've done that's on my bucket list happened after 50. Everything. I mean, it's like up to 50, I was just laying the groundwork for all the things that were going to happen in my third chapter, all the things that I'd always wanted. They came true after 50. I'm not admitting how old I am now, but I'm getting older. <laughs> and they're still happening. I'm still knocking amazing things off my bucket list. I mean, it's crazy the wonderful things that I have accomplished after 40, after 50, and climbing. <laughs> and so I'm here to tell you if you're over 40, which most of the people who watch my broadcast are, the rest are chasing little children around, <laughs> um, it's not too late. It's not too late, ever. The oldest student that started with me so far was 91. I was written up in a full page article in the Washington Post on a holiday weekend and my phone rang off the wall. This is kind of what launched my career. And um, after I'd been working really hard for five years, um, and the, I picked up the phone, I was on my way to a workshop and the lady said, hi, my name is Sadie Brown. And I just read about you here in the Washington Post, and they said you could teach anybody how to draw. And I'm 91, and I always wanted to learn how to draw. And I said, the Washington Post? I had no idea they had written about me. The Washington Post? Did you say the Washington Post? Never mind that she was asking me how to draw. I was just like, the Washington Post wrote about me? They had written a full-page article about me on the front cover of TV Guide on a weekend in January, a holiday weekend in January. And I mean, literally from that moment on, my phone rang off the wall. I sold out an entire edition of the Pencil Drawing College that we're now taking online. And um, it was record-breaking for me, and it was record-breaking in more than one way. Sadie Brown was 91. And she was starting to learn to draw. See? You don't have to wait <laughs> till you're 91. But if you're 91, I can teach you how to draw. I can teach anybody, anybody how to draw. And why? All the reasons that I talked about earlier in the broadcast. If you're just joining us now, go back and watch the front of the broadcast. Because Nita learned it first to get fame. And she could have turned that into fortune because she had tons of offers for portraits. And a lot of my students have made thousands of dollars on their portraits. My student apprentice in the UK, six months into her program, she had already fielded her seventh commission. Um, and uh, she was making thousands of dollars, and she was a stick figure artist when she started. So you could, Nita could have made thousands of dollars, but she chose not to. And then the second thing that she did was she used it to siphon off stress when she was going through a grueling circumstance when her husband was sick. And the third thing, when her husband died and she was going through the worst tragedy of her life, she used it to grieve and to siphon off the grueling stuff that comes with grief. And now at 91, she was invited to out of 3.5 million, I think it is, in San Diego, 12 people were chosen for this prestigious art center and she was invited to display 90 of her 500 portraits that she's done for her 90th birthday. 
So you can make this whatever you want it to be. You can use it to siphon off stress, to help improve your health. You can use it to give yourself a challenge if you're retired and you just really need a challenge. Um, you can use it to process grief by drawing people or animals that you've lost. You can use it to, um, to meet new people and um, draw portraits of people that, that you meet. Either charge them or do it for free if you, ha you have the means to support yourself and you don't want to you don't feel like you want to be told what to do, you just want to draw what you want to draw, then you can just draw to give as gifts and build all kinds of karma, <laughs> all kinds of reciprocation of people that really appreciate what you've done for them. And I'm going to go over there and talk about how Nita used her drawings to really make a difference in the world, the world that she lives in. And, you know, when you're 90 years old, you don't want to feel like your life is over. You want to feel like you're making a difference. You know, you want to feel like you're not past your cell bite or that you're just on the porch waiting for God to come collect you. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You can live every second that you're alive and die with your boots on. That's the way I plan to live. I want to live every second and keep adding things to my bucket list and keep growing and keep staying you know healthy and I, I know for a fact that I am way healthier when I draw than when I don't because that nine months after the fire was one of the most grueling years of my life it felt like a year it was well a whole year after the fire it was nine months that I couldn't draw and I had no way to siphon off horrible stress it was horrible awful and I had no way to siphon that off because my drug of choice, which is drawing, <laughs> um, was not available to me because my arm was damaged um, just before the fire. So I know the difference between life with art and life without art. Life with stress and no art, life with stress and art. You know, and that art just empties me every day. Every day I go into my studio, I draw, and it just cleanses my body, mind, and spirit, and I literally disappear from the world. And sometimes I forget. I have to set a timer if I need to be somewhere because you lose track of um, time and you can miss appointments or um, you can stay up too late. <laughs> I've done that. I've been, I'll, sun look at, I'll sit down to draw at maybe 10 o'clock and all of a sudden I, I realize, oh, I should probably go to bed. And then I look at the clock and it's 3 a.m. <laughs> Because I didn't know, you know, it's just, you just disappear. And uh, someone, you forget to eat. I forgot to eat. Um, you know, I forget to eat a lot when I go in my right brain. My assistant was reminding me today because I was working on videos. And when I'm working on videos, my brain goes into the creative zone. And she kept saying, it's time to eat, <laughs> you know. So, um, so anyway... When you do art, you tend to disappear from the world and you forget what uh, all the stress. So that's your motivation today and it is also your tip. Do art because it's good for you. Do art because it's good for you. Now I just want to mention before I go over to talk about Nita's work, I'm just going to talk about her really briefly and then come back and wrap up because we're almost done tonight. But before I go over there, I just want to explain kind of how the Angelo Atelier works, okay? In the olden days, I used to teach live workshops. I traveled all over the world, and I taught in Venice, Italy for Anthony Robbins. I taught Louise Hay, who came to class in her Rolls Royce. I taught uh, for colleges, and I taught for, you know, private groups and things like that. Um, a whole bunch of very wealthy women hired me to do, they all showed up in a limo, and they took art classes for me. A millionaire flew me to his villa for a week to um, to give him classes, and I charge a lot of money for that. Um, and they don't even blink. I mean, Anthony Robbins paid me 80% of what I earn in a year for four days. They don't even blink. And um, <clears throat> so I was traveling all over, and I was doing all that, and I just got tired of it. I got tired of, I didn't, I loved the work, but the traveling, oh, with airport security and with, you know, all these no food on the airlines, you have to get there early, 
you know, and all that. I just got tired of traveling for work. And so I decided that I would peanut butter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I decided that I would stop doing that. And um, when my home burned down, I literally couldn't teach locally. So I decided I would go online. So that's when I discovered that my programs were all over the world, and but people were not enjoying paying fifty dollars to have them shipped. If you minimum for a priority mail box is fifty bucks, just for a medium sized box, for my courses to go all over the world, it was fifty dollars. And I had a student in Norway who kept buying them, and then she just said to me on Facebook, Sandra, could you please put this online, please? I mean, it's worth the $50 shipping and the hundreds of dollars that you're charging, you know, for the courses, but I want to get feedback from you. So I started an online program. This is about six or seven years ago. Same thing I used to do at workshops and at the college and in private lessons, exact same stuff, but I started doing it online. And I found that I really enjoyed working with people who want to be good. And I found I don't enjoy working with people who don't show up. They buy the course and I mean I get the money so why should I care? But I do. I don't like it when they buy the thing and it sits on their shelf. And so I decided I was going to start working building an apprenticeship program where people could work directly with me one-on-one. -on -one. And the more I did that, the more I realized I, I need to make those groups really small because if they're not small, I can't give enough private attention and I can't give critiques to the people who I'm working with and they're not going to improve unless I give them critiques because that's what made me better. I mean, for years I tried books and videos and it, I never got better because there was nobody to tell me what I was doing wrong. And so, um, so I started working with them and the more I worked with on online people, the more I realize that some people are, are not faithful, they don't follow through, they don't show up. And so I started kind of eliminating them from my programs. And then I also noticed that I needed to keep the group small because um, I, I wanted them to get better. And the only way for them to get better is if I showed them how, by critiquing their work and telling them, no, you did this wrong, you need to do this, use that pencil, use this paper, press a little harder here, the whiskers are off there, you don't have enough shadow behind the nose. You know, I was telling them and, and their work was just, phew. I was kind of worried that it wouldn't work online because in person I could grab their pencil, but it was actually working better online because I couldn't grab their pencil. They had to make the changes and not me, and so they were getting better faster than they were in my live workshops. And here's what happened to me. I loved not traveling. I live in San Diego, and apart from today when it really rained, we usually don't have weather. And I love living in, you know, I always tell people it's, a, it's not easy for me to travel because I live in heaven, and I don't like going back to earth. And so, um, so I, I really love, I started redefining what I want uh, for, to do for a living, and what I want to do for a living is apprentice students. And so that's why we're going to be opening Pencil Drawing College in a couple of days. I, I let the secret out. In a couple of days, we're going to open a few spots, and I, can, I have to keep it really small because, again, I want to be sure that I'm giving you one-on-one -on -one time so that you'll improve like Nita did. And um, I, I also... Um, and there's going to be a few spots open in the atelier. Now, just let me explain the difference. Pencil Drawing College is a four-week coaching. You get four weeks of me and four weeks of another master coaching you through your growth as a drawing artist. And then you have access to the whole curriculum for six months. And it's only a 10, -week, 10 or 12-week program. I have to look it up. And uh, but you have access for six months, so you can finish it on your own if you feel like it. But uh, that's grade one. You know that's where you should always start. If you are a beginner, you need to start with pencil drawing college. 
If you were advanced and you never learned how to draw properly, you need to go back and pick up grade one because otherwise your art's always going to be wobbly. So even if you have a four-year art degree, I had a four-year art degree and I didn't know how to draw that well. So I had to go back and pick up those skills and that's what I'm teaching you is how I got better. And then, uh, so Pencil Drawing College is grade one, right? And it's a four, week, four weeks of coaching and you're going to get... Um, 10 weeks, it's a 10 week, 10 or 12 week program. I've got to look it up. I'm a, not a number person, but I'll look it up. And then you'll have access to that for six months. And we're going to launch that in two days. So if you are signed up at PencilDrawingCollege.com, you will get an invitation. And let me give you a tip. When it says in your email uh, subject, it's open, open it. <laughs> open it. Because we sell out like this because we can't take very many people and the, I literally have people on five continents watching these broadcasts and that I'm sending email people to people who don't even watch Facebook they're not a part of Facebook and so they're watching on YouTube or they're emailing me back and forth begging me to let them in you know and so um, so it tends to sell out like instantly I remember I'm on a subscription to watching things in Hollywood and I always loved Dancing with the Stars. Becky and I watched it together for years. And she had to be 16 to go to it. And so when I get an email in my box that says, I forget the name of the company. But anyway, the minute they say they have spots for Dancing with the Stars, you've got to click right then. Otherwise, the next time you look at your email, it's sold out. So we'll keep that open for a couple days, but if, if we don't sell out. But if we sell out... It, then we'll close it early and then um, in a couple of if not then in a couple of days we're going to close it because then I'm going to be busy coaching and I don't want to I won't be in Sandy Land anymore and uh, I give all my energy and all my attention to those people who sign up for that program and so then there's this other program which people keep asking about which is the Atelier and I'm just going to describe what it's like because some of you might be interested and we did have a couple spots open up um, and so we're going to be interviewing people to join that program too. Um, and here's what the Atelier is. It starts in grade one which is pencil drawing college and then you go into color theory college and there's two color theory colleges and by the way you get more than you get in this pencil drawing college we're going to have a 10-week program but the other one is like this full curriculum of pencil drawing drawing flowers drawing wildlife drawing faces drawing animals drawing dogs drawing cats and all that kind of stuff the pencil drawing college that starts in a couple of weeks that one is just going to focus on drawing cats and dogs one flower and one one uh, portrait so you're not going to get the full pencil drawing curriculum, but you'll get plenty, <laughs> enough to keep you busy. And so, um, plus you're going to have a lot of bonuses during that time too. Um, but then uh, the Atelier starts in grade one, so we give you the full-blown pencil drawing college, so we're sure you master your skills in all those areas. And then we jump into color theory where you learn how to mix colors so that you don't end up with mud on your paper or your canvas like so many of you do. And I even have quilters that take that class because combining colors, it, it, it's important to know that. And, and even, um, you know, people who knit and do all, anything with color, you need to know color theory. So we go through two um, levels of color theory, learning how to mix color and then learning how to apply color in various um, arenas. And then after that, we jump into Color Pencil College, where I open up this vault of um, secrets from all the top masters all over the world. Because for 11 years, I was the executive director of the International Color Pencil Symposium, where we brought four to five masters every year to uh, San Diego. And then I would, I would collect all their secrets and turn them into workshops. And so we have a whole private vault of Color Pencil College where the people in the atelier get access to that and they get coaching all the way through. They get uh, nine or ten months of coaching and then um, after they're, they've perfected those skills and learned what papers and pencils and accessories and all the different methods that you can use to achieve different kinds of effects, 
Then we jump into them drawing their own projects. So uh, Lori has a dog named Daphne. And um, in last year's apprenticeship, um, she got to the point where she'd earned the right. She built enough drawing skills that she could draw her own dog. And so she just has been working on this beautiful, adorable little critter. And uh, um, Teresa, who used to be in our program, um, also uh, drew a dog. And, and um, Debbie, I guess, you know, this is a theme. Debbie, who just lost her home and her dog and her have been moving all over the place until so she finally found a place to live after the California fires took her home. She drew her precious little dog. And, and uh, you know, some of them are drawing other things, too. Um, Stacy, um, who used to be in our program, Anastasia, she was drawing her son's uh, adorable little wind-up boys. <laughs> and, uh, oh, my gosh, they're so stinking cute. I would be, I'd be a horrible mom because I'd be snapping pictures all day <laughs> of how cute they are. And so she drew that with the do the little boy holding the cat. And so they get to draw the things that they love. And I coach them all the way through that so they can start building a portfolio in case they want to um, enter contest or they want to earn money uh, to pay back their fees and also to just have mad money or maybe they want to earn a lot of money. And then um, we also take them through this eight-week marketing course which teaches them how to make money how to deal with copyrights and trademarks and how to do the right kind of release and how to build a website and how to do publicity so you become famous, so how to deal with clients, how to price your work, you know, all the things that you need to know if you want to be a successful artist. That comes as part of their program, a $2,000 program, and they get it for free. And then um, we jump into them doing colored pencil if that's what they want to do, they hang a shingle with the colored pencil work. We get into that with them so that they can learn how to apply color theory to their colored pencil projects or, you know, whatever. And so we spend this whole year, rather than just grade one, Pencil Drawing College is grade one and, and it's a wonderful program. It's fabulous. But if you feel like you want to continue past grade one, you want to do the whole year, then um, we'll talk later about how to apply for that, uh, those few spots that we had open up in the atelier. So um, anyway, that's kind of an overview. A lot of you have been asking me questions, sending me private emails and private messages and and um, even phone calls saying, how do I sign up? You know, where do I learn more about how to become an amazing artist? And I don't call myself an art teacher because I'm not. I mean, that's a little bit of my job, but I'm more of a coach. You know, I come in here and give you inspiration, and I am a business consultant. I tell you how to succeed in your work, um, and so that, you know, put this price on it, not that price on it. Say this, not that. You know, and I, uh, yesterday, I taught you manners, <laughs> how to function in the art world. I mean, I, I'm like a mother, you know, a very art mother for you, and... I am um, a life coach and a creative coach and I teach you everything you need to know about succeeding in art for whatever reason, whether you want to do it for fun or you want to do it to um, leave a legacy for your family so that when you're gone these wonderful portraits will still be a part of their lives um, or whether you want to earn a lot of money and we can make you do that. We have people who are doing that. Um, and or whether you just want to make a little mad money to pay for your supplies, pay for your lessons because you love being in the art village. Um, all the different reasons, whether you want to siphon off stress, you want to use it to meet new people. Art is so multi-purpose. I mean, art is just, it's a way of living. It's totally a way of living. So anyway, um, if you haven't signed up for pencil, www.penciledrawingcollege.com, go do that right now. And... Um, it will be a chance for you to get the email tomorrow that has the surprise. In a few days, we are going to open Pencil Drawing College, which is grade one. And if you skipped grade one and you're, you even have an art degree, go back and pick up these skills. Or if you are just getting started and you have stick figures like Nita, who's being featured tonight, um, it, can, um, it can be amazing 
the amount of progress that you can make in a short amount of time because my system is designed I'm using the old masters methods like um, Da Vinci and Degas and Michelangelo and all those others use these te techniques but they didn't live in a, in a culture where things have to go instant like a lot of you don't have another decade to devote to becoming a master you want to become a master now so I figured out how to make it happen fast so that way, you know, you become, you go from, you can master art in days instead of decades. That's what I always say because that's literally what happens in um, my atelier and um, so, and in the apprenticeship programs. So that's kind of an overview of what's coming up. There'll be more about it. I'm, I've been working hard creating a video that describes it even better than I did today with all the details and stuff like that and that'll be coming in your box if you're signed up at www.pencildrawingcollege.com okay enough about that now I'm gonna go over and talk a little bit about Nita and then I'm gonna wrap up with one more inspirational um, quick little vitamin for the brain the, the mind body and spirit by encouraging you to say that you're never too old to succeed at, in following your dreams. Now let's see if I can do this without turning the thing off. I get kind of frustrated with my technological skills. I'm actually better than the average blonde, but um, I still am a little technically challenged sometimes. Let's see if I can do this without shutting it off. By the way, if I accidentally shut this off, just go to Sandy Land and then look over on the left hand side where it says discussion and you'll see me show up again because I will come back. Okay, let me try this and see if I can do it. One more time, touch screen. Okay, I got it. Good job. Okay, so we'll point it at the fire. Not at my Christmas presents that still, um, Christmas stuff that still isn't. Anybody else got Christmas stuff still hanging around? I still haven't put away all the boxes. Been too busy. Okay, so now I'm going to go to Nita's page and I'm going to see, I'm sorry about the bumpiness here. This happens when you move the camera around. And here we go. I'm going to put this on my lap and then I'm going to see if I can angle this so you can see. All right, there we go. So this is what Nita was drawing like when she first came to my class. This was a self-portrait of her when she was a child. And you can see it's stick figures, it's flat, it doesn't show any signs of promise. And then this is the first drawing that she did that was ended up being published. This was after I'd been coaching her for a few weeks. Um, I think it might have been a month or, or two and then she did this drawing and you can see why I immediately said Nita we need to put this in a book and so it ended up in books and magazines this was a little girl she used to babysit when she lived in Pasadena and then uh, she went on to do some more portraits of people that she knew and family and friends as well and you can see you know when you look at the details in this gene and the jeans and all the puckers and I mean it's just ridiculous how she was able to master textures. I mean, look at this here. <laughs> I mean, it's just hard to believe this. I know that some of you might not even believe me that it was the same person, but it was. Look at the texture in that hair and look at the texture in the straw hat. It's just ridiculous how good they get and how fast it happens. And then uh, she went on, she loves complicated things. She found that one of her favorite thing in the world was when it's ridiculously complicated. And so she drew the checks and the stripes and the wicker and she just got this amazing likeness of these kids and I showed her how to use the battery eraser to draw with you know to put the white in so she used the battery eraser on the bottom of the feet here to create those little nubs that were in the slippers and um, pretty soon she was drawing uh, she was world famous you can see there's that piece of art on the cover of the book and then she was invited to uh, broad, uh, broadcast on television and um, 
She, this is the drawing that ended up on the cover of the book of the program that taught her how to draw. So that was a huge, huge excitement for her. You can see, the, when you look at this, would you think that she's 90? I mean, she's 90. It's crazy. I mean, her skin is, okay, I'm not going to go into this. I'm so jealous. <laughs> but anyway, I am using her skin, skin cream, by the way. I'll give you a link to that later. Um, so this doctor helped her with cataracts, and he corrected her vision, and now she sees 2020. She's she's never had to wear glasses, so she drew him with his daughter as a gift. And so, like I said, she was using art as a way to give back to the people who were giving to her. And you can see these textures are just ridiculously fabulous. Again, hard to believe. Then, like I said, she went into the phase where she lost her beloved husband, and so she started drawing their courtship, and this is the love mobile that he would use to drive from his town to her town, which was far away, to pick her up so they could go on dates. And it's so funny how, you know, in those days, men dressed up for their women. <laughs> I wish that was still true. Anyway, so she drew portraits of them from their courtship, and that helped her get through the grief. And then she started drawing for others. This woman died of cancer, and she's cuddling her baby. And so she drew this portrait and gave it to the husband who lost his wife to cancer. And then this little boy was killed in a car crash. And um, when he was uh, on his way to college, he and the dog um, didn't have their seatbelts on, and they flew out of the car and died. And so she told the mom, you give me any um, photo that you want and I will turn it into art. And so here, the little boy loved, he wanted to be a fireman and, and so she drew this for them. So you can see she was turning her grief into something good by helping other people who were also grieving because she understood their emotions. And she started to draw... Um, this was a church that she was attending, so she drew the pastor and his kids, and everybody's asleep except the cat. <laughs> and um, she would draw people that she would run into in a restaurant, and she would draw, she drew this of her husband when it was Veterans Day weekend. He was, he served in the military, and so she drew this to honor her husband, and also to rewind the courtship that happened when she met him and he was in the service. And then she drew a, a little soldier uh, as well for somebody else the next Veterans Day. And here we are back at the beginning. So you can see that um, Nita went through all the different ways to use art. And she has found a, her third chapter has become amazing because of art. Now, here's the last thing that I want to talk about, and it's a little video that I put up for you today, and this is the story of Colonel Sanders. In fact, I think I'm going to go back over to my table and talk about this, because you don't need to see it on the computer, so excuse me while I bump around a little bit here. This is always a little awkward when I'm moving back to my desk, but there's peanut butter. You can stay focused on him. He always attends the broadcast. And then I'm going to see if I can switch this uh, without turning it off. There we go. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so I put up the um, broadcast about Colonel Sanders, and I did this because the theme of tonight is that you're never too old. You're never too old. Um... Colonel Sanders was um, unsuccessful at everything he did in his life. He failed and failed and failed, and at 65, he retired. And I'm not going to spoil the story, but it was after 65 that he invented Kentucky Fried Chicken, and now that, that company is worth a billion dollars with a B, and he started at 65. So after this broadcast is over, I want you to watch that video. It's so inspiring. You really helped me get over this whole idea that I had passed my sell-by day. Because we live in a culture that doesn't understand that youth isn't everything. You know, you can um, be incredibly productive when you're retired and incredibly productive 
even if you're, you know, over 40 and you finally have time, the kids are gone and your car is paid off and you have time to take care of mom. I have a cousin whose daughter is just getting her license and she's all excited because she doesn't have to be a taxi anymore and that's the last one that can drive. So she's going to have some freedom. And so I wanted to leave you today with some really amazing inspiration. Here I was, when I started, I was one of the most pitiful artists. I couldn't draw very well. I had to go back and pick up skills by apprenticing with a master. And when I apprenticed with that master, that was the turning point. I had been, for 10 years, I'd been drawing from books and drawing from videos and thinking I could learn it on my own. And I made progress from mediocre to not quite as mediocre. And um, then I realized, I studied the masters, the old masters, and I realized, oh, how they got good was apprenticing with a master, because then you get that critique. You know, the critiques are what help you go from horrible to amazing. And so I did that, and literally within, like, a few months, I had gone from being disgustingly awful, mediocre, to fielding commissions for nine pieces at Scripps Memorial Hospital, Scripps Birthing Center, which was like a five-star resort. People, uh-oh, my internet's going down, so I better, better wrap this up soon. Anyway, I ended up being nominated by Rhode Island School of Design for a fellowship award as the number one art coach in the whole United States. And this was somebody who was awful when I started. I had no talent. I didn't have the money to do it. I didn't have the time to do it. I was working four jobs. I didn't have the training. I didn't have anything, but I believed in my dream. And I believed that even though I was past my sale-by date, I could make my dreams come true. All of this happened after I was 40. And every dime of those, the, the million dollars, more than a million dollars that I've earned happened after 50. Because... I realized I have not passed my sell-by day. Rhode Island School of Design was declaring they're the number one art school in the United States, and they were declaring that I was the best, the very best at turning um, amateurs into amazing artists. And um, that's why they nominated me, not because of my own work, because my work is good and it's collected by you know, corporate and private collectors, but what they gave me my fellowship award was for making you good. They know that I'm good at turning people into masters and it happens really fast. So um, I want to encourage you today, no matter what age you are, oh the battery's dying, hang on. Okay. <laughs> All this fun technology. No matter what age you are, and no matter whether you're past your sell-by date or under your sell-by date or whatever, uh, state, uh, Anastasia is um, raising two little boys, but she fits it in after they go to sleep. And um, uh, Inez is working two jobs. Inez, my um, apprentice in Germany in the atelier, she's working two jobs in order to afford this. And uh, she still fits time to draw, and, she, and her progress is just ridiculously fabulous. And so whether you're still working or you're still a mom, still have kids, you can fit this in. And if you're retired or you, uh, you have extra time and your kids are gone or whatever, you can fit this in. And so don't give up on your dreams. Don't ever think that it's too late. It's not. It's not too late. And um, I just wanted to let you know, I don't know if I'm going to do this again next year because it takes a lot of time and energy to work with you and pour myself into you and it, it kind of restricts the, you know, my travel plans and things like that. So I don't know if I'm ever going to do it again. But for this year, in a couple of days, if you're signed up at PencilDrawingCollege.com, you will get an invitation to come into PencilDrawingCollege.com and We'll be sending you a video that has more details about what it contains and all of that kind of stuff. So my inspiration talk to you today, it always ends with this. I like to be the best I can possibly be. I was brought up by people 
My mom and dad were the best in their business. My dad was trained by Wycliffe to break languages into writing, and they translated foreign languages into writing so that he could translate the Bible and set up schools and orphanages and churches for them. And my sister was the first woman in the House of Representative in her district. I come up from a family that just loves to achieve. And you need to be your best. And whatever that looks like, it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be the best version of you. And you are the person that you're competing against. Your old self is what you're competing against. So when I'm competing, I'm always competing about how I was last year. Can I be better this year? And we're going to be having a really nice program for you where you'll get this kind of coaching on a regular basis. And there's just this amazing group of achievers that work together and encourage one another and cheerlead each other and, and so forth and so on. It's just super, super exciting. But our philosophy in the atelier and in the apprenticeship program is always to go for the gold. Always go for the gold and make sure you're working with somebody who can help you figure out how to get that gold. So you want to always work with the top master. And then when you have all these dreams and you're going for the gold, remember, there will be miracles. There will be miracles. So believe in your dreams and make them come true.